Hey guys, I'm Andrew McCurman. Welcome to Web3 TV. In today's video, I'm with Mike Charolambus, the CEO of 3D. And we're going to discuss the most important Web3 concepts as they apply to e-commerce in a bid to help e-commerce owners maximize their success. But before we do, make sure you register to watch every episode of Web3 TV here, where we share inspiring stories of all things Web3, making a difference to the world. All sorted? Okay, let's go and meet Mike. So Mike, welcome back to Web3 TV. In today's episode, we want to talk about Web3 and 3D concepts and how they apply to uh, e-commerce. So first of all, I guess, what's the difference between the internet and the 3D internet? Um, so it's very simple. Um, it's basically the, the flat version of the internet versus the, the vertical version where you can, you, you, you go away from the swiping to the navigating. <laughs> um, and basically that's what actually brings a whole new dimension of how you interact, discover, explore products and brands and information. <laughs> Okay, so can you be clearer on that? I'm a newbie and and I'm still not quite sure. So give me an example. You mentioned swiping and navigating. What's the difference? So imagine like going into I don't know the far fetch um, marketplace. You need to swipe to go and see products. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, um, you will need to swipe quite a lot to be able to discover products that are sitting at the bottom. Um, but if you go into the 3D internet where all of a sudden it's more of a kind of a virtual shop built uh, in, in a way that allows you to just walk in and immerse yourself and like navigate and see th things in front of you instead of like swiping, um, that's where we create a whole new um, um, way for, 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 for people to, to, to discover and explore. And at the same time, instead of like clicking an image, having to then go open another page where it gives you all the descriptions, information in the 3D world, you go in, you click the 3D product and just right next to it, it either generates more information and you just close and you continue browsing. But ultimately it gives you a much bigger browsing uh, autonomy um, and, and, and everything can be interconnected, right? From, from data, from products, from, um, from, from try-ons, you know? Sounds more fun. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a lot easier too. And so what's this augmented reality that is becoming quite prevalent? Augmented reality is one of the, the major frontier technologies that is being introduced in the world. Um, and it it's ultimately uh, the tool that allows you to blend your physical world with the digital world um, and having the ability to be able to either generate experiences or see products right in front of you or within um, your your physical contextual uh, if like space um, which will either inform you better about specific products or specific um, uh, uh, you know experiences or they can even enable uh, brands to provide a tool for users to generate content in ways which we have never thought before. So from a, a commerce, creative, and also informative or education perspective, AR is is really one of the best uh, tools that are, are going to optimize all these foundations. And this is why we're also seeing some of the biggest hardware players out there like um, Apple um, talking about introducing uh, AR glasses and, and lenses because really that's going to be um, the, the natural evolution of moving everything from a screen where we swipe and read into our contextual uh, world, basically. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's still very early on. Uh, there's still a lot of things that one needs to uh, to adhere and, and resolve, but it's a huge promise that it can really take, um, you know, uh, interactions to a whole different level, basically. Mm. I, is, was Pokemon, the Pokemon craze, was that augmented reality? For those that, like, it gives them a reference if they are familiar with that? Absolutely. I think uh, Pokemon was the first 
of its class that was able to make AR accessible to everybody and give them a small taste as to how it is to really start embracing and enjoying things that they're not really there, but you see them in front of you and you, and you get the rush of excitement. So um, that was definitely uh, a huge unlock basically into the possibilities of AR and also to understand um, how user behavior, uh, uh, you know, shapes uh, once they encounter this sort of like merge between the physical and digi digital world. Mm. And another one I've seen uh, re regularly on TV here is this on sport. So the, like the panel might be standing there or the expert uh, related to the sport, but next to him, he might have an actual player or uh, statistics coming up on screen or whatever. And it's like, how are they doing that? They're in the, they're in the studio. Is, is that an, another example? Um, this is not entirely AR, although it, it is being used on the same basis, but, but yes, uh, right. So imagine you don't even have to see that from the screen. Imagine you're walking in a stadium and you can scan something and straight away all this information appear in front of you, all the players appear in front of you and you can see their, their size. You can take pictures next to them, even if they're not physically present. So yes, it's going back to what I said, it truly unlocks such tremendous possibility of content and education, information, interactions that uh, we're still at day one as to where it's going to go. But definitely entertainment is going to be one of the industries that are embracing it faster. And they're doing some really, really cool stuff. And, and everyone else is like watching so that they can try and implement it into their own uh, industry brands. Yeah. So what I see with that, though, like with the football guys and stuff, it's like they're there, but they're not there. You know what I mean? Those, those. Uh, I, I'll, I'll use the word avatars, but they're not essentially avatars. They're just images. Um, but it's like you can see the best of both, right? The real world with the presenters and the digital world next to them, and and it be and it's able to merge the two. So, with that being said, if we we want to liken this to e-commerce or relate it to e-commerce, how is this going to affect or be beneficial to e-commerce? Um, there are three ways right now, as we speak, that AR is becoming truly beneficial for a lot of the brands um, that they're embedding it into their commerce channels. The most important aspect, especially for products such as bags or barbecues or cars, is the sizing. Does that car actually fit in my garage? Does that barbecue actually fit in the space in the garden that I'm looking to put it? what is the actual size of the back before I buy it is are, am I confusing it based on on the images I'm seeing so it's actually smaller than what I anticipate it to be so the the sizing um opportunity that it comes out of AR where you're able to see the products in their true dimensions in your space it's phenomenal and and this uh, also adds value on the conversion side but also on the product return side because you get exactly what you you see ultimately Secondly, um, uh, especially for for accessories uh, and, and shoes, we're now seeing this whole new notion of uh, AR try-on, where you're able to see a watch on you, to try shoes on you, sometimes also garments, even though it's still not perfect for, for garments, but it does kind of fulfill that, um, that, that psychology in, in a user's brain that I would like to, to see it on me before I buy it. You know, people, a lot of people are visual. So, you know, um, in order to pay something that's more expensive, although there's always a catch here as well. For very expensive products, if you're able to actually see them on you at least once, it kind of fulfills that urge. So you're no longer ready, eager to go and buy them. So sometimes it has the negative boomerang effect. So it depends, you know, you really need to be a bit strategic with those things. Um, but as a, as a rule of thumb, like if you can try it on before you buy it, you know, perfect, you know. Uh, and then the third thing is just an experience and it's just user generated content. It's a whole new way for people to show off that they're testing something or they're seeing something. And, and if they're creative, they can create a whole nice uh, user generated content with the stuff in AR, which they can share and, and, and you know, they can either show off with their friends, with their creativity but it also enables the brands to to tap into a whole new way of marketing organically their, their products, basically. 
Cool. So what I'm hearing there is it's really a great way to see what things may look like before you actually have them, whether it's houses, kitchens, barbecues, cars in the garage, clothing. But here's a big one because I know one of your clients is Diageo. How does it work with alcohol? <laughs> um, I don't remember. It's always quite blurry every time we launch the executions. <laughs> no, but in all honesty, um, there are two elements in which we work with uh, Diageo, and 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 trust me, I tell you, those guys are miles ahead in terms of innovation. Their their innovation managers and their innovation teams are like, it's as if they transcended from 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 a galaxy far, far away into this world and trying to educate us. But um, two profound ways in which this makes sense for them is with their uh, sales field agents, uh, which they go to different bars and they say, hey, what if you use um, our beer taps into your bar? They flash on the AR to show them how the beer taps look onto their bars and it's an easier sell. And they don't need to go around carrying all those beer taps and placing them on the on the bars and what have you. Um, Secondly, we're introducing this whole new notion of immersive menus. So having the ability to scan a menu and see how a product is being prepared, a cocktail is being prepared or, or how it looks uh, with some really nice gimmicky, you know, explosions, let's say around the cocktail. It's usually a much more fun way uh, for people to explore and order uh, cocktails. Um, and this goes back again into the whole entertainment aspect. And then when it comes to purely e-commerce, um, one thing that we're seeing and they're using 3D uh, NAR is again around sizing. So not, not confusing a 70 CL bottle with a 50 CL bottle. So, you know, AR is going to show you exactly the, the size of the bottle. But at the same time, using 3D, they're able to build all this sort of storytelling around more premium shelf bottles like, um, uh, you know, like bourbon or, or, or whiskey or malts, where basically... You can see the product in 3D. You can open it, unbox it from within the box. You can click on different hotspots around the 3D product, which it generates videos or context or sounds to see how different ingredients were sourced in or to see the sound of the distillery while it's producing the, uh, the, the malt or to even understand the notes that that malt is going to, to generate for you once you try it. All these things are great ways in which you tie in a nice storytelling around a product in a much more immersive display and you enable users to interact with it, which also kind of helps you understand why it's priced at that price range that is being displayed. You know? That Honestly, that's a fantastic description. You've got me like really thinking creatively there. And I guess that's what AR is about, right? Is to help people picture before they receive. Uh, it engages all the senses and and people buy an emotion, don't they? They don't buy an intellect. So it, it really stimulates that emotional charge and, and probably increases conversion rates significantly. But at what point will the taste sensation be available in AR? <laughs> well, I mean, that's going to be, um, you know, in a different decade or maybe in a different lifetime from now. Uh, <laughs> but Although I did hear that Sony is investing in a few uh, Japanese uh, companies that they give you the ability to smell things through your browser. It's interesting. I don't know how they do it, but uh, I mean, there are some crazy dudes out there that they're testing this kind of technology. So maybe it's going to come faster than what we anticipated, you know? That'd be a game then, changer, then, wouldn't it? Then, then actually the high street, that's when the high street might actually suffer, you know? Yeah, that'd be incredible. So tell me, what about NFTs and e-commerce? How, how, what are NFTs and how are they related to e-commerce and why should I care as an e-commerce store owner? Um, the only reason that right now the so-called NFTs should be of, um, of any discussion is purely for token-gated access. And I think that is going to be the, uh, the focal point of discussion for e-commerce in 2023. Do you have something in your wallet that shows that you're part of the community? Do you have something that proves that you are already a legal owner of a physical or a digital item? Then here is like this very hyper-personalized page or experience that you can unlock because you're already part of the community. Uh, and to some extent, this can also be tied back to CRM. So uh, having this, um, this community of, of wallets and people owning your products, and they want to be part of your community, then it's much easier to generate all sorts of different different loyalty programs and different, uh, 
you know, experiences that they you can make them their adv- your advocates, basically, and they can go and bring more people into your community. Uh, there's nothing else which is, you know, more tangible in 2023. And I don't want to spend too much time being very romantic way ahead because, uh, you know, it's always, to, it's better to slice the elephant, as the Japanese say. <laughs> Cool. So with NFTs, non-fungible tokens, they're a way to, in, in, in the e-commerce space, enhance uh, the community engagement, feel like you're part of something and have some digital ownership of an asset that is unique. Would that be a good understanding? Uh, I couldn't even phrase it better myself, yes. <laughs> and why, as an e-commerce owner, should I care about that? So is it a case of... I need to start thinking community and what can I offer them over and above what they're already buying? You truly shouldn't um, care that much about it for the time being, uh, predominantly because there are not that many people with wallets out there. There are not that many people that, uh, you know, in further decision patterns, whether they can have an NFT or not from a specific brand. Uh, But if you really want to address to that specific audience, which is still very niche, uh, that they're always after NFTs. And I think we're still a small bubble and we're just playing between that bubble, between us, nobody else outside the bubble truly cares. Um, it, it's just to to learn and get educated and just get ready for what is gonna happen later on. Um, I always advise brands to launch something small, provided it's not gonna um, truly impact their, um, their P&L. Uh, because the more they get familiarized with it now and they do a small touch points left and right to understand how they can connect physical with digital, how they can forge different experiences in real life and digitally, um, that is going to be quite uh, interesting. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's not a must have for most of the e-commerces right now. However, with the rumors that Amazon is going full Web3, and dropping wallets to all of their users, that could be the the massive leap where overnight everybody's is is wakes up and they have a wallet in their in in their possession. So that could be where you know the 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 the, the full transition into Web three, and possibly if most of the brands still have no clue what an NFT is or how they can embed it into their commerce mix. Maybe they might again risk to to fall out very um, very soon, uh, but all of these are still hypotheses. So I um, you know I, I don't want to uh, to scare people or create a FOMO um, unnecessarily right right now. One thing that always excited me a lot about digital collectibles and NFTs is actually the staking. Um, so being part of a community that you truly. So for instance, if I truly love nikes or adidas or whatever and i know i'm going to be a fan and i know that i tend to be around for the long term if i had the option to own you know nike or adidas nfts or even tokens which i know i could stake so that i can use to transact within their ecosystem but also stake to generate more of those that would be a tremendous crm that i don't understand why not more brands are doing it you know um each having their own kind of of of, of token basically that their community can use within uh, those ecosystems. Um, I, I find it ext- extraordinary and, and the potential is huge, uh, but I think still people d- don't really understand the power of staking and and having their own tokens basically within ecosystems, you know? So give us an example and be even more specific because I love the concept, but um, staking. So just give us an example, say, I don't well, know. I mean, look look what Yuga Labs are doing right now. Uh, for me, uh, you know, staking staking ape coins is possibly the easiest passive income I have in in 2023, and I think brands should be watching that because uh, if they see how many people um, are and, and Yuga Labs doesn't have that 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 huge of a community, right? Maybe they have what twenty thousand people, maybe thirty thousand. Um, and they're generating so much value and so many people are actually transacting within that community using the ape coin and staking the ape coin um i don't see why nike or others wouldn't be in a position to, to do the same thing you know and i would be happy to have tokens from a variety of brands that i i i i, I love and i i'm there for the long term because that's what truly makes me um officially part of their community 
it shows it, it allows me to have a vested interest in them and it'll and, and it's actually a good locking <laughs> uh or segmenting a relationship between a brand and a user you know plus I- it's the free money right if if you if you right now enable your users not just to spend money with you but also generate money with you you know it's a win-win right <laughs> So give me an example of, say, Nike. If I've staked my tokens with them, uh, they have their own value, but how do they earn a passive income for me as well? Well, it's not precisely a passive income. So maybe you wouldn't expect that you're going to be generating 50 pounds every month out of Nike, but maybe you'll be generating 50 tokens that allow you to buy more Nike products at a discount. So again, I'm saving money in a way, right? So Fantastic idea. Another way of doing discount or loyalty programs, right? Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. So tell me about the metaverse and for e-commerce. Is it important? Is it a hoax? What is it? As I said, um, the, the only problem right now with, again, with the so-called metaverse it, it is that it has no real users. There's nobody there. So what the heck are you doing spending money there, right? Um, that's why I feel that until there's actually a real world, that a, a real metaverse because right now anyone that builds a virtual world they name it as a metaverse and it makes no no sense to me at least right um and i think uh, my best bet around what could be the future metaverse is is spatial because those guys are playing it very nicely they are right now there's something like the youtube of the metaverse where you go in and you search for different uh workshops and different experiences but slowly slowly they start connecting this whole thing and they really big build a huge realm of of experiences and worlds and brands and what have you that actually could have a good stance of being the, the metaverse as we know it but all those like the central lines and sandboxes and what have you they're only doing harm in the environment by keep labeling themselves as, as a metaverse they're virtual worlds right so you have many virtual worlds you can go and do stuff inside but you should not call them as a, as a metaverse um so the moment we we start talking about virtual experiences and 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 and, and spatial experiences uh, uh that makes more sense versus a metaverse you know so if the brands wants to have their own virtual store that which they can build on unity or unreal engine or they want to build within any of these other bigger virtual worlds happy days um but it's still uh, not massively proven that it can have a lot of longevity Predominantly because brands don't know or they, they don't have the manpower still to um to sustain it in a long-term manner. And they don't understand the, 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 the extra utilities that they can be introducing from that. So right now, it's just a nice marketing campaign. Uh, but the more the brands invest by building more relevant teams around it and how they can tie it back to the real world and how they can introduce more utility, I think that's where we're going to see more meaningful uh, engagement. Uh, but definitely, I'm I'm also not very bullish about around um, you know the likes of, of of Sandbox and all those guys because I think they've they've built it wrong from the beginning. They got some precedence uh, because they were the first to do it, and there was a huge hype with with the hope. But the more we navigate into the space, we understand that um, there's not really light at the end of the tunnel for those guys. But you know, the, the hope is going to be for something which is much more in high fidelity and that it really gives you an opportunity to interoperate. And I can't truly interoperate if I have a voxelated 3D and then I need to take it into a high fidelity world. It makes no sense. And there's a lot of people also that they don't appreciate those types of, of, of 3D models either. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see, you know. Well, the way I look at it, especially in a spatial metaverse, is it's taken thousands of years to create planet earth and culture and society and buildings and roads and everything else. So to try and turn on the metaverse in a a few years is, it's a pretty big ask, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. And I think a lot of people are trying to be very egoistical in their approach. Like everybody's trying to build their own metaverse. And and first of all, this is wrong. I mean, it sounds wrong as well. Like what, that's what I'm saying. Like people define the metaverse in such a wrong way that (laughs) already uh, is destined to fail once they have that approach, you know? But if you have something that is open-ended and you allow people to connect and do things and uh, attach all these different things and a lot of other creators and you don't think about it egoistically and you don't want to make millions overnight or become a billion overnight with a closed ecosystem, um, you then, you know, 
that's the only way that you have a shot. Otherwise, you're destined to to fail at some point, or maybe you will sell your company to somebody else for a few millions and then move on to the next, next project. But you are not really bullish about actually building and contributing into this whole notion of, of, of the metaverse. You know, Absolutely. And um, when you look at all these concepts, these Web3 concepts, how do you think they're changing the face currently of e-commerce? Um, it's going back into your very first question, navigating from a static internet to a 3D internet. And it's basically, it's all about this whole new way of interacting and discovering and navigating, um, which which basically we're going to be seeing a whole new consumer behavior uh, transition, basically, and a, and a shift uh, of paradigm, if you like. So, yeah, it, it's all part of this whole new internet as, 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 as it's being shaped, basically, you know? And what is your future vision for what you know now and what you believe to be coming down the pipe, so to speak, to the future of e-commerce? And I, and I know you can't answer that in a long-term scale because no one can, but but what are you thinking? Well, I mean, because we're right there in the in the in the trenches in the first line of the war, you'd be like, what what I'm I am telling you is that everything is going to start by being a bit more immersive. Everything is going to be the, um becoming in this new internet basically more transparent in terms of like authenticity. Uh, tied back on blockchain so that you ensure that what you see is what you get. Uh, you're going to have way more protection as a consumer after you purchase uh, something that you are the legal owner, that it's it's certified. You'll, you'll have a much uh, bigger accessibility and traceability of, of stuff. So really we're seeing, we're going to be seeing a shift um, um, of, 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 of information and power going more towards uh, the buyers versus uh, the sellers, um, and 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 we are truly going into a whole new era where product displays are going to go to the next level, and it's no longer going to be boring to actually sit on screen and discovering. You know, and this, so this we- is like this is my my very short term uh, vision. And if we want to take it a bit midterm, I think you you tie all this with the avatars, with the immersive product displays, with whole new um, set of data that brands can can extract. We're then going into a massive hyper personalization era where every user can use a three internet and have a whole different experience uh, versus the person sitting next to them. You know, and I think that is going to be a very beautiful thing, and that's where. Um, we, we're going to be truly seeing true engagement and 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 and, and true long term relationships between brands, products, users, and 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 what have you. The only risk is that we risk of trapping users longer into this internet, so they might have less time to spend in real time, in real life. So you know that is also going to be an interesting bet to see how you can truly mix and blur the two. And industries, which one should embrace it first before risk being left behind? Um, very hard question. Um, it's just typically the rule of thumb says the industries that they're typically um, more accessible to a wider audience, such as fashion, such as um, accessories, um but those are are the industries that those are the the kind of brands that they they tend to go in first because they're always consumer first um they 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 have a wider audience that they want to, to cater and they want to ensure that they maintain a market share so if those guys do it well then it's just easier for everybody else to come in then with a uh, a, a more niche audience or with um more more niche kind of products to to uh, to follow their the you know to, to follow the threshold that those guys set but also because those guys they, they tend to have much bigger budgets and much bigger uh innovation by budgets to start testing things you know? fantastic well mike as always thanks for sharing your wisdom everything 3d and e-commerce um i did call you in a prior video actually it's a future video we interviewed mike uh about his story and his is uh journey into uh, 3D and Web3, which I'll put a link up here for you. But 
I called him in there the three DM medium. But I'm actually the more I listen to you, I'm actually starting to feel like you're the Rafael Nadal of the three D world, or being Greek origin, maybe the Stefanos Tsitsipas. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can always accept the Djokovic since our CTO is Serbian. So. <laughs> Well, they're all pretty high class, aren't they? But as they're always, mate, thanks for thanks for sharing your thought leadership, your wisdom. And um, guys, we've actually got the pleasure of putting together another interview with Mike. It's related to the inefficiencies and, and also the, the questions around the um, environmental sustainability of 3D and Web3. There's, there's some misperception there. So Mike's going to help overcome some of that. If you're interested in that, uh, we'll put a link here to that as well. Um, Mike, as always, mate, thanks for coming on the show and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Pleasure, pleasure, guys. Well, there it is, guys. I hope you enjoyed this Web3 TV episode. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below. And remember, if you'd like to watch every episode of Web3 TV, visit the link below or subscribe to our channel. And remember to hit the bell icon so that we can notify you every time a new episode is released. I'm Andrew McComb. And I look forward to sharing more inspiring Web3 TV episodes, making a difference to the world. I'll see you soon.